All right. Good morning, everybody. All right. We are on Mark chapter six today, and it is uh, lots of verses. It's 56 verses, lots of narrative. And so I'm not going to comment on every verse. We're going to read it and discuss it in sections as we usually do. And, um, and I'll just talk as we go and we'll see what um, comes of it. Uh, Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you. We thank you for the opportunity to, to open your word. We thank you for the opportunity to hear all these prayers and testimonies. Bless you, Father. We thank you. We ask that you'd open your mind to the, your word and um, help us just uh, be fed by you this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, I do. I have the four kids. So I, I think one of the nurses in the school got COVID, so they're all home. <laughs> praise the Lord. <laughs> all you can do is praise the Lord, right? <laughs> so anyway, so we'll get we'll get in there and we'll start off. Um, verse one of, of chapter six. And when he went out from there and came to his own country and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began, to, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which was given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is this the carpenter? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could do no mighty work there, save that he lay his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went around about the villages teaching. All right, so we see that that uh, he he came and back into his own country, and the word country there could just mean even Nazareth itself, his own place. Basically, it's a broad sense, and so he's coming back to where people think he's from. We know that Jesus has a heavenly origin. We know that he's the the, the son of his father, but the many of the people are are coming to terms with Jesus, so he comes to his own. And of course, being the Sabbath day, he's, he's teaching in the synagogue, verse 2. Uh, the Sabbath was given, you know, as to be a day of rest. But of course, by Jesus' time, it was also came to be a day of instruction, uh, even a day of worship, when people would gather to um, hear from the Word of God, be taught. And the people are marveling, as we can see, where, who is this man? You know, in other words, we, we, we thought we know him. Is, is the, the takeaway that we're going to see here. Who is this man that says these things? He says things are not ordinary. They're not normal. Uh, where does he get his wisdom? So they're, they're questioning who Jesus is because without a revelation from the Father, Jesus looks like a five foot nine man. You know, he doesn't, he's not walking around with angels' wings, you know, flying everywhere, sort of thing. Not that angels really have wings, but you, you get my point. And so, well, some angels do have wings, but anyway, that's a, <laughs> but uh, there they see a man, you know, and they're like, where does he get his teachings? Uh, where, where does he get his power and his authority? What wisdom? So they're, they're marveling at the things that he's able to do and accomplish. But then they say, verse three, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But then they begin to think, they begin to be offended because they're like, but we, he's just a man. How can he do these things? And the fact that they mention his, his, has been brought up, his, his mother, but not his father, because they don't, most of them don't believe. They don't, they, they're like, well, who is his real father? We know that Joseph's not his real father. So who, where does this man come from they they say joseph's not his father they they they, they know surely that he's 
that it's been said that he's born of God, but the Jews have this blasphemous tradition that he was uh, illegitimately born. And so this could even be a slight way to, to say is not just the son of Mary, because after all, we know that Joseph was the adopted father of Jesus, that, that you know, that Jesus's genealogy also comes from Joseph being the son of David. And so they're, um, they're offended at him. You know, they don't know what to, to do with this Jesus. Um, and they, 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 you know, and they, they think, hey, he's one of us sort of thing. And so, um, so, but Jesus said in them, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house, so even among his own house, among his own family. And we know, according to, to Mark 3, and we have Matthew's account, which seems more explicit, that even his own family seemed to really think that Jesus was out of his own mind. We can go back to uh, Mark 3, and um, you know that passage where um, uh, Mark 3, verse 21, and when his friends heard, and this heard of it, this would be the teachings of Jesus. They went out to lay hold of him, for they said he is beside himself. So he is out of his mind. And uh, when it says his friends heard him, it, the word there is not the typical word for friends. It means those who are close to him. When those who are close to Jesus heard all these things that he was saying, they thought, well, who is this man? And then you can go down in verse 32 of chapter 3. The multitude said unto to Jesus, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren seek for you. And Jesus said, Well, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Then he took around about them and looked around and said, You all are my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same as my brother and sister and my mother. You who are listening to my message, you are my true brethren. And so there does seem to be a time when the initial family of Jesus was confused. And um, we know that Mary held the things of Jesus and the teachings in her heart. And that, that she was a while to ponder on these things. And um, I don't think Jesus was being overly harsh with his mother, but I, there was a time where they, they really seemed to, to, to come, to have difficulty come to grasp with, um, with, with who Jesus is. And, um, Certainly, uh, we also know, like has been stated, that in John chapter 7, 5, you know, when the brothers of Jesus told him to go up to the feast, that it says the brothers of Jesus did not believe in him and the stages of his ministry. And so I'm painting this picture to show the kind of opposition that Jesus faced from those that were most intimate to him, even his own brothers and sisters, probably even some doubts from his own mom throughout but the beautiful thing is, as Jesus progresses doing the will of God, and as God vindicates him on the cross, we see that the brothers of Jesus and his mother, of course, of course, his mother was ultimately faithful. She was there at the cross, even when his other disciples, most of them at least, fled. And in Acts chapter 114, we see in the upper room, we see the brothers of Jesus, and we see the mother of Jesus. And so, Jesus knows what it's like to be disowned, to be even vilified, to be misunderstood, and everything, a whole range in the middle from being misunderstood to being vilified uh, by his, his family and by all those around him. And so, um, like you said, a prophet is not without honor, but except in his own country and among his own family his kin, and in his own house. And it says, he could do there no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And so without faith, there's no miracle. You know, Jesus came. Yeah, he was the word of God incarnate, but he lived like a spirit-empowered man, obedient to his father. He lived as a model for how we should live. Yes, he had unlimited power at his disposal, but he laid aside the prerogatives of what he could do so he could be obedient for the sake of our salvation. 
so we can live life and go through our temptations, go through our struggles, and ultimately go through the death that we're all going to face. And so he lived under the power of the Holy Spirit, and he did not respond if there was not faith either faith in the people who came to him for healing predominantly, but also faith who believed for those who believed in somebody else's healing. We see this when the man who was paralyzed, who was brought down in the roof, Jesus healed that man on the basis of the people's faith who brought him because of, he saw their faith, the ones who brought the paralyzed man down. He says, according to your faith, be healed. Like, let it be so. But here, Jesus could not do a whole lot because there was not an atmosphere of faith. Save that lay his hands on a few sick people. So some there was a little bit of faith. Some people had faith. And he healed those who had it. Verse 5. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about the villages teaching. So you know what? Jesus didn't let us slow him down. Even his brothers not believing him. Even maybe his mother's thinking he might be a little bit loony. His mother thinking he might be a little bit loony. It's possible. I know the, the Greek's not explicit over there in chapter 3, but it, it seems to be pretty apparent that it's those who are closest to him. And um, especially if you take the whole context into account. But even though he's facing this misunderstanding, and he's facing even outright hostility for many people, uh, he's, he's, he's going to serve his father. He's going to preach the gospel no matter what. So he just, he went about the villages teaching. Verse seven, and he called unto the 12 and began to send them forth two by two and gave them power over unclean spirits. And it's not, he doesn't hoard all that power himself. He doesn't hoard that responsibility himself. He doesn't hoard all that gifting to himself. He gives it away. He gives it away to others. You know, all these ministers that want to be the man of God on the YouTube, and anybody can start a YouTube channel. I'm glad there's YouTube channels out there, but really, you could be on the YouTube, and your life could be in shambles, <laughs> you know? And so it's like it's an automatic ticket to ordination. Just get on YouTube, and here, boop, you know? And again, I say this as somebody who has a lot of respect for some brothers on YouTube. Don't get me wrong. But Jesus, Jesus gave his blessings to other people to do the ministry you know he sent people out to do the work it's called spiritual multiplication you know if you were to invest your life and to disciple pour your life into three people in your lifetime and each of those people could devote their lives and disciple uh, mentor three different people you wouldn't just add you would you would expound you would explode with multiplication the amount of disciples around the world serving Jesus Christ. And so he called forth 12 people. He mentored them. And those 12 mentored, 12 mentored, 12, and now all of a sudden you got thousands of people serving the Lord. And he sent them forth two by two, and he gave them power. And that's why the disciples waited in, in the upper room to get power from the Holy Spirit. We need the power from the Holy Spirit. We can't just do ministry on this on our own strength. We got to wait on the lord to give us power and to wait on the lord is to seek him that's not to sit around in a passive state it's to pursue the lord to say lord you lead me you empower me i need you you know and then to do the things that he tells you to do and jesus gave them power over unclean spirits he gave it to the church the authority to drive out unclean spirits resides in you you do it you get these unclean spirits out of other people. You get these unclean spirits out of yourself. You heal disease all in the name of Jesus. He's given you power and you authority to do it. And he commanded them, verse 8, that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only. No script, so no, no thing to say. No bread, no money in their purse. There's a sense of urgency. Jesus is raising up an army of true believers, of true brothers and sisters to him. You know, for those who hear the word of God and do it, those are his true brothers and sisters, you know. And so even as his true mother and father, you know, and it's not his father, but, you know, he read the passage, you know, the passage in Mark that we just we read, his true family, his true family 
of those who do his, his will and the will of his father. And so they're going to they're gonna rely on God. They're not even going to take any food. They're going to rely on the father to provide for them. And there's this urgent urgency. But be clawed, be shod with sandals, but not put on two coats. Just go out there. Don't try to prepare overly. Just trust the father to take care of you. And he said to them, and whatsoever place ye enter into a house, there abide till you depart from that place. And so, no, you're going to go. And, and in other words, the father's going to raise up a family to take care of you. And they're going to meet your needs. You're not going to go all around the place, you know, looking for your needs to be met. You're going to be there. Your needs are going to be met. And you're going to preach my gospel. You're going to lay your hands on the sick. They're going to recover. You're going to cast out demons. And um, so, in other words, not only the workers need to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and are called, but those who take care of the missionaries, those who take care of the least of these, my brethren, you know, they likewise are called. And if God, maybe God's calling you to support somebody and to support some ministries. And the reward is, as far as I can tell, equal in that regards. And it's just as much of an honor. And so, so yeah, be, be listening. We should be listening for the Lord to see what he would have us do uh, in, in whatever ministry he has for us. And so, so yeah, whatsoever place you enter into a house, there abide until you depart from that place. And whatsoever ye and, and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you when you depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And so the gospel, Jesus said, I didn't come to, to bring peace, but a sword. Repent and believe the gospel. This is, this is the day of salvation is today. You know, God sent Jonah, the prophet of Nineveh, saying, repent. And that's all he said, repent, you know, repent or destruction is going to come upon the city in three days, right? And so there's an urgency to the gospel. We are dead in our sins. And we need God to resurrect us. You know, the idea when they shake the dust off of their feet, that's a way of saying, you know what? I've done my due diligence. I've preached the gospel. I've told them about Jesus. And so if, they're, if people aren't receptive to the gospel, there is a, a time when we have to say, okay, well, God bless you. There's been some seeds planted. God's going to do what he does but I'm going to need to move on somewhere else. Why? Because we don't build the kingdom. The Holy Spirit builds the kingdom. We need to keep in step with the Holy Spirit because the Spirit is blowing where the Spirit blows. And all we're doing is we're cooperating with him. And so when they shake the dust, they're saying we've done what we've done here. And there's also, uh, according to a lot, scholars say, according to history, when Jews would, would come back to Palestine, would come back to Judea from being in foreign places, they would shake off the dust from those places so as to not contaminate the holy place, so as not contaminate their country with that foreign soil. And so there's a, there's a sense that it could be after they preach the gospel and these people wanted nothing to do with it at these villages that it's a way of saying, well, these places are unclean and I want the uncleanness out of my life, right? And that sounds kind of harsh, but we do need to get the leaven out of our life. We do need to get out of Babylon, you know? And so, because it's more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah and the day of judgment than for those cities who reject the preaching of the gospel. And they went out preaching that men should repent. And as I said, they went out two by two, you know, and it's in other places in the gospels that said they went out two by two so they could support each other so that they could be there for each other um, so that they could be a witnesses for each other and strengthen each other's arguments, uh, strengthen each other's faith. And so they went on to preach that men should repent and there's no, I would argue that true faith, true faith in Jesus, we're saved by grace through faith, 
has repentance built into it. There's no true faith without repentance. Repent and believe the gospel is what the word of God says. And they cast out many devils, verse 13, and they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. And I just would want to go back just a second on that repentance and faith. And that's why a lot of people have false conversions. They believe in Jesus because it sounds really good to believe in Jesus because you get to live in heaven forever. Yeah, let's, let's believe in Jesus. I could live forever with God. Yeah, I'll believe that. Have an intellectual understanding of God and say, well, yeah, sure. I could fess in those Lord and believe, you know. But if there's no repentance, there's no like real faith in who he is and the fact that he needs to be Lord and he needs to be master. And I need to come upon, I need to come into his kingdom. You know, and that's why there's always repentance with the true gospel. And so, so yeah, we don't want any, hear a gospel that any gospel without repentance is, oh, you don't need to repent. Just believe as if you could separate the two. I'm saying you can't separate the two. They go hand in hand. It's the same gospel. And uh, they cast out many devils, anointed with oil, many that were sick and healed them. And this is part of the kingdom program is the casting out of devils. If the casting out of demons were not meant to be a permanent feature of the church and life in Christ, then why in the world did Jesus teach his disciples? Why did he command his disciples to do that everywhere he went? If that's just something they do for a few years, it makes no sense, especially since he, he commanded them to teach others to observe all the things that he commanded them, which is casting out of demons. So the fact that the church missed the boat, well, that's, that's on us. Jesus commanded his disciples to do it. He didn't do it just for a short time, but he commanded them to carry on that godly tradition, if you will, of casting out of demons and preaching repentance and healing the sick. And anoint with oil. And yes, you can anoint with oil because Jesus commanded it. Don't be afraid of Catholics and stuff. Like anointing with oil is in the Bible. God blesses the physical. Like our bodies are a blessing. He dwells in, our, he dwells in us through his Holy Spirit. There is a sense that the oil. Go downstairs, Henry. Go downstairs. There's a sense that the oil, which is a, a visible symbol of the Holy Spirit, increases faith when we see that symbol of the oil when we see that the oil which is not just a symbol it's it's a real thing that we we know that that increases our faith when we see it so don't be afraid to use anointing oil and there is a sense that god uses the oil like a vehicle for his presence we see this with with handkerchiefs that touched paul uh went around and drove out demons to people that weren't in Paul's presence. So those handkerchiefs were like an extension of his presence. This is just in the Bible. And we need to get over our anti-Catholic fear. I'm not a Catholic. Thank you, Jesus. But I don't think we should be afraid to do anything that's in the Bible. And so in this case, he anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. And King Herod heard of them, for his name was spread abroad. And he said, that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth from themselves unto him. Others said, this is Elias, and others said, this is a prophet, or one of the prophets. But when Herod said thereof, he said, it is John, whom I beheaded. He is raised from the dead. So people are wanting, you know, they're, again, they're, who is this Jesus? Some people think he's just, he's, he's a powerful prophet, you know, well, he is a powerful prophet, but he's not just a powerful prophet. Others say he is Elias, you know, Elijah, you know, because we know according to Malachi 4, 5, let's see if we can flip there real quick, Malachi 4, 5, and the end of the Old, the Old Testament, the last couple verses. Behold, I will send you Eliah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. That's how the Old Testament ends. So Eliah, Elijah is supposed to come before the end, and we know that John the Baptist 
comes in the spirit and the power of Elijah. And Jesus does call him by the name Elijah. So there is, in a real sense, he is Elijah, in a, in a real sense. And so, um, but uh, Herod's sort of very confused on the matter, apparently. He's like, well, maybe John the Baptist rose from the dead, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> he beheaded him. And so, uh, and then we hear that we're going to read the, what happened there with, with John the Baptist. Verse 17, for Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. So, you know, Herod, this, this sicko, had stole his own brother's wife, Herodias, and married her. And according to, you know, I haven't read a lot of it personally, but Josephus talks about all the incest that's in the Herod family line. Apparently, they're pretty, pretty wicked and pretty, pretty disgusting. And um, call, he calls himself King Herod. Of course, here in, in verse 14, he styled himself a king. He went and asked permission to be called king from Rome. And that ultimately led to his downfall. He was, he was a puppet king. Uh, he was, Herod was a family name. Uh, he was a tetrarch. Uh, he was a ruler of Judea and Adamea. And his brother Philip was a ruler of one of the other surrounding areas in the region. Um, they, they ruled on behalf of Rome, these, these, these regions of Roman areas that were considered Roman providences. And so, and if I'm not uh, mistaken, he was, uh, I think Herod was, this Herod was a half Jew. And so, anyway, um, so he stole his brother Philip's wife, Herodias, and John the Baptist was saying, uh, you can't do that. <laughs> That's not lawful. She's still married to her husband. He never divorced her. <laughs> and so, for John had said to Herod, it's not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore, Herodias had a quarrel with him and would have killed him, but she could not. But for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy and, and holy and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So here, Herod was afraid of John, but he knew in his heart that what John is saying is true. And he had great respect for John. He knew he's a man, man of God. But we see what happens and we know what happens. And when a convenient day was come that Herod, on his birthday, made a supper to his lords, to his, his supporters, his cronies, the other royalty, you know, Jewish royalty, you know, high captains and chief estates of Galilee, Roman officials too. They're all Roman officials, ultimately. And when the daughter of, of the said Herodias, of the daughter of Herodias, came in and danced, and pleased Herod, and with them that sat with him, the king said to the damsel, ask me whatever thou wilt, and I will give it to thee. So here this damsel is, is dancing for them, and it's seemingly somewhat erotic, just, just the context, it makes you think that's probably the case. Oh yeah, and this is probably his niece. Yeah, gross. Ask me whatever thou wilt, and I will give it to thee. And he swear unto her whatsoever thou ask of me i will give it to thee unto the half of my kingdom wow he's really drunk and she went forth and said unto her mother what shall i ask and she said the head of john the baptist and she came and straight away with haste unto the king and asked saying i will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of john the baptist in other words, she wants the, the head of John the Baptist in the flag, basically. And the king was exceedingly sorry uh, for his oath's sake and for their sakes, which sat with him. He would not reject her for his oath's sake, for his own pride and not wanting to look weak. Well, the fact is he is very weak. But there's some interesting parallels between Herod and Ahab in the Old Testament. You know, both, you know, were rulers. Uh, both had bad marriages, <laughs> uh, both were weak and passive, 
and they knew the right thing to do, but they did not do it. We even There's even a, a passage where it says that Ahab rent his clothes and repented, but he still ultimately listened to Jezebel. And here, Herod ultimately listens to his, his wife. And uh, both of these women were, were not godly women. They were led astray by the devil. And these weak kings were led astray by the devil and did terrible things uh, through their wives who weren't following the Lord. And there's this interesting parallels, I think, between them. And so, um, uh, verse 27, and immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard of it, they came and took up his, his corpse and laid it in a tomb. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all these things both what they had done and what they both what had what they had done and what they had taught and so it's kind of like this story of John the Baptist is sort of put in the middle of Jesus's charge to his disciples to go and preach the gospel of the kingdom and so you can almost it's it's sort of like a, an interlude you know and so you can kind of read where we were that they went out and cast out many devils and anointed with oil. And they were sick, that were sick and healed them, verse 13. And of course, verse 12, they went and preached out that they should repent. And then verse 30, and the apostles gathered themselves together into Jesus and told them all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, come ye, ye yourselves apart unto a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going and they had no leisure and so much as to eat. So in other words, they needed to eat. They needed to rest. They had been working. They had been doing ministry. They needed to rejuvenate. And it is possible to do so much ministry that you can burn out, <laughs> you know? And Jesus said, you need to rest. You need to come with me and rest. You need to get some strength from the Father. And I would submit that if Jesus himself needs to be nourished from his Father, if Jesus himself needs to get away into a lonely place to pray to the Father, how much more do we? And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. Verse 33, and the people saw them departing and many people and many knew him and ran a foot thither out of all the cities and out went them and came together unto him. The people were desperate. They were running towards Jesus. They're running towards even his disciples that they could be healed. They could be delivered. Verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion towards them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. He began to teach them many things. Jesus had compassion because these, the leaders weren't doing what they were supposed to do. The leaders were not giving them the true, pure word of God. They weren't preaching love and mercy and compassion. They weren't laying their hands on them and healing them. You know, well, they, they, they had the Holy Spirit in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. They were mighty men moved by the Holy Spirit, healing people. The leaders were too busy with their own parties and feasts and their own, their own places in the table of honor, their own navel gazing at their own righteousness that they didn't care about the people. They wouldn't love on them. They wouldn't pray for them. They wouldn't give them light and truth. So the people were like sheep without a shepherd. So Jesus rather began to teach them many things and began to do many miracles, of course, as we know. Verse 35, and when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, this is a desert place. And now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. In other words, look, we're far out here in the middle of nowhere. They're going to they're gonna starve out here. He, Jesus, you need to send them back into towns so they can get some food before it gets too dark. And um, Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat. 
<laughs> give ye them to eat. He answered them and said, give ye them to eat. And they said unto him, shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? And Jesus is like, you don't get it. You got power and authority. You don't know who you are. You give them something to eat. Jesus has high expectations for his followers. And he says unto them, how many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they said five and two fishes. And he commanded them to sit and make sit down by companies upon the green grass. Five and two, five and two. And I think these numbers are probably symbolic. Some people think they're not, but five loaves, two fishes, five. Many people see five being the law. Two being, you know, uh, the two covenants. Because, you know, uh, John, uh, Mark, and all the Gospels are written from the perspective of, you know, Jesus said these things, but of course he's risen from the dead. And so five being the law, two being the covenants, two could also be the two tablets of the law, it's possible. But what we need to see here is Jesus is fulfilling all things. He is fulfilling the law. He is the one that's greater than Moses. He is the one bringing the new law, the law of the kingdom, that sort of thing. So five and five loaves, two fishes, and they're sitting down in these companies, uh, reminiscent of a, a Roman army, you know, possibly even showing that God is preparing an army, a spiritual army sitting down here in companies that are going to serve the Lord and get her ready to follow him. They sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. Just the fact that there's ordering here, it's, it is very interesting. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and break the loaves and gave it to his disciples. You know, he's, he's given them food. This is reminiscent of the manna that was given in the wilderness. This is reminiscent of, for us, of the messianic banquet to come when we will eat with him and that great feast, that great wedding feast. This is reminiscent of that foretaste that we get when we break communion with each other. We can go to Mark 14. You know, the Lord's Supper, the language is very similar to what we have here with Jesus feeding the 5,000. Verse 22 of chapter 14. And as they did eat, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and break it. You know, same language. And gave it to them. and said, take eat, this is my body. He took the cup when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank it. He said, this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many. And so he's, he's given them his body. He's given them his blood there. And I, and I real sense he's given them his body here in a real, in a spiritual sense as well, showing them that they're going to find their spiritual life in him through his teachings, through his life of the Holy spirit. So he's going back to um, uh, chapter 41 like we already read, we'll read again. And when he had taken the five loaves and two fishes, he looked up to heaven, blessed and break the loaves. Same language, gave it to his disciples to set before them. The two fishes divided, he amongst them all. And so this is showing that Jesus is, uh, Jesus is, is, is everything. <laughs> he's, he's the new lawgiver. He's our life. He's our nourishment. And they did all eat. And were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fishes. 12 being represented, 12 is typically Israel. So there's fullness overflowing throughout all Israel. And I would say throughout all the earth, because the gospel of Jesus is, is given out to all the nations. There's an overabundance that's left over. And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. The women and children are not explicitly numbered. It could be that there are many, 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 many more with the women and children present. Unless men is interpreted in a generic sense, meaning people. That's possible too. And straight away, he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go into the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And again, it could just be he went up the mountain to, to be in a lonely place. But again, the, to go into the mountain, he's shown to be a new Moses, one who's a better Moses. 
one who did things that Moses could never even do. You know, and we're going to see an example of that here to come. And when the evening was come, the ship was going off in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. And he saw them foiling and rowing. So they were rowing hard. They're having difficulty. For the wind was contrary to them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. So Jesus sees them struggling. He's, he's walking upon the sea and would have gone right by them. So in other words, he doesn't see them as being in mortal danger. He was prepared to go by them. But in God's providence, they see him walking upon the sea. You know, this is, this is ultimately going to be a sea. Uh, uh, we're going to see this as a revelation of who Jesus is. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed that it had been a spirit, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. And when he went up into them, into the ship, he got into the ship, the wind ceased, and they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure and wondered. For they considered not the miracles of the loaves, and their hearts were hardened. There's quite a bit to unpack here. Jesus is walking upon the sea. He's showing that, that, that he is he's greater than Moses. That he himself, like Job says, you know, that, that the most high is the one who can walk upon the ways of the sea. We see this in Job 9, verse 8. This is a manifestation of who he is as God's son. That he, he can go up and, and commune with his father. He can, he can give them fret, food to eat, not just the manna in the wilderness, but he himself is the living bread. Whoever eats of the bread of life shall never again hunger. Whoever drinks of him will never again thirst. And they don't understand who he is. He walks upon the waters. He walks upon the sea. He's the incarnation of life and truth itself. He's the incarnation of God. The father is there with them literally through his son. And they, 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 they do not see who he is. And so he says, be not afraid. And that's why, you know, when, when he comes and he calms the storm, he takes authority over and the winds cease and they wander. That's why they did not consider the miracle. Of the Lord. They didn't understand them. That, that they, Jesus was not just feeding them with a great miracle. He's saying, I am the resurrection of life. And John will parse this out further, the gospel of John fully. They don't know who he is fully. But Jesus loves them anyway. <laughs> Jesus blesses them anyway. But he's amazed at their hardness of heart. They still don't fully believe. Verse uh, 53. And when they had passed over, they came into the land of Consenerate and drew towards the shore. And I got to go back. When it says, be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. In verse 50, it is I, ego, and me, I am. I am. <laughs> it is the I am. There's so much there, but we'll go forward. I just wanted to bring that up. And when they had passed over and came into the land of Gethsemane and drew to the shore, and when they had come out of the ship straight away, they knew him and ran about through the whole region round about and began to carry in about in beds those who were sick, where they heard where he was. And so the people were flogging to Jesus. Yes, he came to his own and his own received him not. Yes, many of his family members were confused and rejected him while he was alive. Uh, yes, the Jewish nation as a whole didn't believe in him. But there were a whole lot of people who still believed in Jesus and put his faith. There were a whole lot of Jews who believed in Jesus. In Acts, uh, we see that it was thousands of people believed in Jesus. Many of them were priests. There's a passage that says that. When you get Acts 1, chapter 14, many scholars say at one time, you know, a good third of all of Jerusalem believed in Jesus. Massive numbers. And so don't think the gospel don't work because it does. It does. 
And so here people are flocking to Jesus. They knew, they say that Jesus is here. They came, they wanted healing. They wanted healing. They wanted a new life in, in Jesus. They wanted to, to live and to follow him and to hear his words. You know, verse 56, and worth, whithersoever he entered, wherever he went, into villages or cities or the country, they laid the sick on the streets and be sought that they might even touch but the border of his garment. Just to touch the hem of Jesus' garment probably would be those those titsi, those, those prayer robe, the prayer shawl, not, not the prayer shawl, those, those tassels that hung from the garment of every Jew, and Jesus is a Jew, so he would have had one too, to remind the Jew to keep the commandments of God. So they even just to touch even that, even, and if it wasn't that, it was just his clothing, the hem of his garment, just to touch you know, just to, just to touch anything that come in contact with Jesus, that they might be healed, that they might be made well. These sick people lying in the streets that would just want to touch Jesus as he walked by. And I tell you, that's all I want to do many days is I just want to touch the garment of Jesus. And I think in many ways by faith, we could just reach out our hands and say, Jesus, I just, I'm reaching out to touch the border of your garment. Heal me, Jesus, according to your word. I want to follow you. I want to walk with you. I want to live for you. I want to dance for you. I want to sing for you. I want to work for you. I want to love for you. Ultimately, that's what it comes down to, just to be able to love for Jesus, love other people, love your family, love your enemies. And they laid the sick. They may touch his garment. As many as touched him were made whole. And that's what we should be about doing today, is introducing people to Jesus Christ so they could be whole, whole in their spirit, whole in their bodies, whole in their mind with the full gospel. All right, that's what I have for you today. God bless you guys. I got to take my, my youngest to a speech appointment, but I'll be listening as long as I can. God bless.